Good morning. Well, I got to tell you, first of all, I want to say thank you. Um, we had our congregational meeting just a couple weeks ago, and then we had our camp out, which was fun, except very hot. Uh, so that was an interesting experience. But it was great to see folks out for the Saturday night worship. It was great to have our unity worship last Sunday. And okay, we're starting the children's message right now. So, uh, fun things. I also wanted to say thank you for um, helping me celebrate 10 years in ministry. Uh, that was such a blessing and a lot of fun. Here we go. I'll just hold you, and then I'll send you back to mom in a minute. So I got to tell you a funny thing that happened only in Nevada. Yesterday, I had to go do a memorial service. Where's mom? Go find mom. Race. Here we go. Okay, I'll help this happen. Okay. <laughs> So, I was doing a memorial service, and only in Nevada, okay? So, I was doing a memorial service for some folks from out of town, and uh, we were having it at uh, the, pepper, uh, the pepper mill. So, first of all, doing a memorial service at a casino. That's a Nevada thing. And I was there, and it was up on the 17th floor, okay? So, I get into the elevator. I'm going up. Some, a family gets onto the elevator with me, and they're like, hey, we're going to the pool. Oh, you're going to the 17th floor. You must, you know, fancy place. Maybe you have a private pool up there. It's like, I don't know. I've never been there before. I'm going up there to do a service. And then they start making jokes about me being a professional male, I don't know, whatever you would call that. Because I didn't want to bum them out. They're going to the pool, so I didn't want to be like, hey, I'm going to do a memorial service. So I just said I was going to do a service. And I was like, this is really uncomfortable. I had my St. Luke's polo on. <laughs> Only in Nevada will you do a memorial service at a casino and be called a hooker. Ten years of ministry, that was a first. So I just had to share that because that was really weird. Um, but anyway, we have a lot of things going on at St. Luke's. We have a lot of ways to plug in over the summer. We're going to be studying Mark, so I'm going to invite you to open up your Bible as we continue to study through Mark. You can do that whether you're in the room or whether you're at home. You can do it on your uh, smart device, your phone, or whatever. Just don't be checking in on Facebook because that pops up because we're friends. And I'll know what you're doing because I can see it. I'm just playing. It's fine. Though I have seen people check in. It's really funny. Like, hey, where are we going to go to lunch? And then I just really want to, in the middle of the sermon, be like, I don't care. Where do you want to go? I'm done at about 1230. Also, uh, don't forget, we have the Stuff the Bus, which is our annual school supply fundraiser or supply raiser. Uh, we get all the stuff together. There's a whole list of those things, and we need those uh, to be back here um, in just a couple short months. I think it's the, uh, August 11th, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, be looking to bring those kind of things in just to help the students in our area uh, be ready for a school year on site in a classroom. So it's going to be big, and we're very excited about that. Um, we do have coffee hour after service, so it's a great time for fellowship, and it's going to be an opportunity for you to meet all of our new members who I'm about to invite and welcome in in just a, uh, just a few minutes after the next song. Uh, we have a fellowship hour, so you can head on down there and take that time to interact, meet some people, say hello if you haven't got to see folks in a year, and it'll be a great time to just chill and enjoy. You might also notice uh, that it's a time to catch up. Uh, we have Katie who is here. Uh, she's been gone for a year in Texas, and she was part of our worship team before. And so she's back here helping lead worship for a week, and Lord willing, you know, let's just keep her. So Ben, we're not releasing her back to Texas. If he, is he, you think he's watching? He might be watching. Ben, if you're watching, we're not releasing her back to Texas, so you'll need to come get her. And then we'll keep you too. That's her husband, for you who don't know. And so uh, you'll be able to see and uh, say hello with her as well, and I'm sure all of her family and friends. And we need to say a happy anniversary to Aaron's 51, which I cannot imagine what 51 years of being with somebody would be like, because I've only been alive for 35 years, and that's been tough to just be around myself that long. So say hello and celebrate with them as well. So I'm going to invite you all to stand up, to shake some hands, to introduce yourself to somebody new, share the peace of the Lord, just share a smile and say, I'm glad you're here. Good morning, St. Luke's family. We're so happy to see all of you here, all those faces out there. Welcome to all of those at home watching online. Join us. We're going to sing about His great love. Your love so great. Your love so great, Jesus in all things. I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years. Still I'll be singing. Oh, 
creation comes all to the Savior. We are alive for your praise in earth and sky. No one is higher. Our God of wonders you reign. Our God of wonders you reign. You are the Lord Almighty. I'm shining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. you to stand up and come forward uh, so that we can welcome you into membership. Come on down. Much like the price is right. Perfect. Come on up and we'll just have you line up right over here for now. This is perfect. Perfect, perfect. I'm going to steal a microphone also. I'm going to steal Katie's microphone. So that's why I'll need that. Well, greetings in the name of the Lord, and it's a blessing to have you. I know that you are people of perseverance because you went through the entire Roots class, and you still want to come back and stay connected to this faith community. Now, when we talk about faith, um, and especially when we hear these words, as I'm going to teach you about the, the gospel of Mark, the word faith often makes us think, these are things that I accept to be true. These are things that I accept as reality, and I uh, receive them and apply them as my own. We think of faith as something very cerebral, something that, that we add to our lives through a worldview. However, in Mark, and in first century Christianity, and in first century Palestine, in fact, when it talks about faith, it talks more about fidelity, loyalty, about being part of the community. Now, if you remember wedding vows, if you've ever been to a wedding and it says, I promise to be faithful, that doesn't just mean I believe that you will be my spouse for the next 51 years plus. It means that I will be loyal to you. I will be a part of you. I will, when all opportunity shows, make myself connected and a part of the we. When Jesus says, as we're going to see to the woman who has the issue of blood, your faith has saved you. It's not just about what she knows about Jesus. It's about her loyalty, 
her obedience, her connection to Jesus, that she believes that this is where grace is. In the same way as we welcome you into our congregation, we ask that by the Lord's grace, he will help you to be faithful to our faith and family community. Because we are all joined together as one body, the church, and we all have that deep feeling of responsibility for one another. So we participate in worship regularly. We participate in the the sacraments together when we make promises to the children and, and those who come forward for baptism that we will help raise them in the faith and we will encourage them. We ask that you would be faithful in that as well as part of our family, as all of us desire to do that together as well. But the good news is it's not about our performance. It's about God's grace and the love that he's shown us through Christ Jesus that binds us all together in perfect unity. And so, this morning, if it is your desire to be members, which it is, because you got their roots and your name is on the sheet, and we voted you into the council, so it's done. No running now. I want to extend the hand of fellowship and friendship to each one of you. And I'll have you, after I do that, share your names, and um, let's, what, what should we do? Let's do where you're from. How about that? Where you're coming from. So, good morning, and thank you. God's peace and blessings. It's a blessing to have you as part of our church. Welcome in the name of the Lord. And now I'll have you face the congregation. We'll pass this down. Just introduce yourself and where you're from. Before My Reno. name is Becky, and I am from Reno. I've heard of it. <laughs> I'm Terry, and I'm from Santa Rosa, California. I'm married to Terry. My name is Richard. I was born in Reno, lived in Santa Rosa, and we're just moving back to Reno. Uh, my name is Helena, and I'm from Germany. I'm John uh, Hours, and we came from uh, the Dallas, Texas area. I'm Leslie. I'm married to John and also from Dallas area. With an applause of celebration for what the Lord is doing, welcome our new friends and family into our church. It is a blessing to have you. You guys may be seated. At the fellowship hour, look for these folks, or just look for new faces and introduce yourself, because that's the blessing of getting to come together in the building and spend this time together. We're going to continue now. Um, with the Apostles' Creed, a set of words that have connected us through the generations that bind us together as the church. So I'm going to invite you all to please rise as we confess these words together in unity. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. There is no fear, cause I believe. There is no doubt, cause I have seen your faithfulness. My fortress over and over. you are famous for shut the mouths of the lies 
Now for the fun. Children, come on down. Let's go. Katie, I'm going to steal your mic again. Grazie. Yo, I see. You plant your tush right here. Sit down right here. Good. Now you stay right there. Okay? Okay. I, I doubt it will happen too. So good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning to my friends who are online, who are joining with me this morning. I wanted to share with you. Nope, nope, nope. Right back over here. Right back over here. Right back over here. Sit right there. Okay, I've got some fun things that I wanted to show you this morning. So, you stay right there. Okay, here we go. Oh, man, this is heavy. This is a, I'm going to show you what this is. This is a box uh, that a friend of mine gave me to help me with off-roading. So one of the fun things to do in Nevada, for those of you who don't live in Nevada, um, we like to take our, I, all of you, but I've got friends who are watching from all over the country on there, and they don't know we have a lot of land where you can just go driving your vehicles anywhere you want, out in the mud, up on steep hills, all those kind of fun things. And I have a vehicle that can do that. However, when you get out there and you're driving around, what are some of the things that can happen? Your car can flip over. Nothing in this bag will help me with that that I know of. You can get a flat tire. You could go up a ramp. Yep, yep. You could run into a tree if you're texting and driving. Never a good idea. You could. What, what do you think would happen if it rained? You could get stuck in the mud. Absolutely. And this bag... Uh, a friend of mine gave me, uh, his name is Josh too, he's standing right over there, and he gave me this bag because this has a whole bunch of tools in it that if you get into a bad situation, you have tools to help get you out of that situation. Now, funny thing is, I have never opened this bag. Uh, we have gloves, um, so I don't really know what it's all for. Now, this, this is to attach to the winch. I know that because I put that in there, but I haven't ever gotten these extra things out. Josh, I'm going to need some help. I really do. I don't even know how to hook this up. Josh is going to help me out with this because Josh knows a lot more about this. Uh, do you guys know what this is? Here, you can come sit down right by me. It's a microphone. Check, check. It, it definitely has a pressure gauge. What's on the bottom of this? You have to okay, tell us. Okay, so what this, first of all, everything in this bag will help with the issues that all the children talked about, including flipped over. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's scary. So that's a tire pressure gauge, and, and it's, it's designed to rapidly remove air out of a tire to a preset tire pressure if you are 
um, in the sand or stuck in the middle of a dry lake bed that's not dry. Okay, seems weird. Been there. Does it seem like it's a good idea to let all the air out of your tires? No, no but apparently it's helpful when you're in sand. Okay, we've got a big old rope. I don't think it's for the yes. winch because it's not attached to the winch. Yes, the very good. It is for the winch. It's called a winch extension line. So if you have 50 or to 75 feet of winch cable on your winch, but the tree is 150 feet away, or the vehicle is, a, you need a winch extension line. Okay. What is it? It is a pulley, it seems, right down there. There's a pulley right there. Yep. Master pull is what it says on it, but I think it also has the name. It says snatch block. So that snatch block is designed so that you can go out to an attachment point, run your winch extension line through the pulley portion of it, pull it back to your uh, attachment point on your vehicle, and pull yourself out without the help of anybody else. More things yep. like that? Yep, same, same. That um, is a clevis that, that uh, attaches to your uh, trailer hitch. Okay. And then we have a big orange strap. So that is a tree strap. So if your attachment point for your winch hook uh, has to go to a tree, you need to protect the tree. And uh, not that we have a lot of trees you can pull yourself out of in Nevada, but just in case. So is it good? kids to have all of these things in my vehicle when I'm off-roading in case something happens? Yes. yes, it is, because it's important to have the tools. You should. I do keep it in my trunk. That's a perfect place to keep it. But let me ask you this. Do you think it's going to be as helpful if I only ever have the bag and I never take the things out of it? No. no. What do you think is going to happen if I put this bag in the back of my truck, which is what I've done, and I never take the time to open it up and learn how to use things? Then what's going to happen when I have a problem? I'm going to have to call Josh and say, Josh, I've got a real problem. I'm stuck. But what's going to happen? What do we know that happens when you go out into the middle of nowhere in Nevada? Do our cell phones work? No. Oh, no. So what's going to happen if I can't get Josh and he can't come out and help me because I'm a long ways away? Yeah, I'm, if best I can, and chances are I'm going to flip my vehicle or let all the tires out or all the air out of my tires. So here's the thing. What should I do to be ready for whatever challenges I might face out there in the off-roading dirt BLM? What should I do? I should practice. I should learn how to use the stuff. I, I could go to his house and he could teach me. Sounds you like guys are exactly right and you just made my life really easy because guess what yeah. this this is a tool this is a tool that each one of us has in our homes that helps us with the challenges that we face in life sometimes we don't even know what those challenges are going to be like we have no idea and we don't necessarily know how to find the right help that we need so we have the tools with us but if we just wait until we're stuck, we can always call. You can call Pastor Josh or somebody else and try to get some help. But if your phone's not working, if you're far away or you don't know what my phone number is, then you might have a little more trouble. So what should we do before we face big troubles and questions in life? We should read it. We should open it up. We should learn. And if it's tricky because it was written 2,000 years ago, we should go to somebody's house and have them teach us how to use it so that when we face questions and unknown situations in our lives, we will know how to use the tools God gave us. Okay? So, I want you guys to do me a favor. When I ask you to open up your Bibles, when I'm teaching on a Sunday morning or in a class, guess what I want you to do? Open up your Bibles to the section. And you don't know where your Bible is? Well, then we will have to find it. And I will begin to teach you what this means and how you can use it in your lives so that by the time you grow up, you'll be ready to go and you'll be able to teach others. And you'll also be able to teach your parents who are very, very Lutheran. So when I say to do things, they just stare at me. 
and you'll show them that he means, oh, we should do that. So that way we are ready for every challenge. So if you don't have a Bible, you tell me and I'll make sure to get you a Bible. And we are going to ask God to help us learn how to use it. So if we ever get stuck or our lives seem like they're flipped upside down, he can help us get unstuck. And if you can't call me, you can always call Mr. Josh Hall and he will help you out. So let's fold our hands. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for giving us teachers to help us learn how to use the tools that you've given us to help get us unstuck. Help us to learn every day and to teach others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, boys and girls, you can go back to your seats. Thank you so much. And we will get started with some of that teaching right now. So, as I'm doing that, you can see I'm going to have my Bible actually open, not sermon notes, um, because I want to teach you the scriptures. So, our goal for the next several months as we're going through the lectionary readings is we are going to go through the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. And Mark is a really interesting and challenging gospel. It's the first of the gospels written, more than likely. And so it has a different shape and perspective on Jesus than Matthew or Luke and way different than John. Um, and and it, it provides some of the earliest ideas of how first century Christians understood who Jesus is in relationship to God and how God works in this world. And so we're going to chew through that. And each week we're going to go over another passage, and we are going to go through this so that by the time we get to November, you will have a pretty good understanding of this, the Gospel of Mark. And so we're going to do that together. I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, and we are going to read through this. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, which now he's on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, please, and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under the hand of many physicians, actually just under many physicians, not under the hand, I added that word, and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather she grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, you see these crowds pressing around you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what uh, they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, so Peter, James, and John, and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. 
This is the passage that we're going to look through. This has got two miraculous events. It's got the raising of Jairus' daughter, and it's got this woman with the issue of blood. And we're going to study this passage because it is a pivotal moment in Mark, and I'll explain why in just a second. But I'm going to invite you. The reason I'm inviting you to get out your, your Bibles and do this is because I'm giving you little helpful hints and notes that you can write right in the margins so that when you come back to learn or read this, it will help bring it into, let's say, technicolor. Um, so that as you read it, you can kind of understand what's going on. So first of all, I want to tell you key things in Mark. Sometimes Mark uses the verb structure that is putting everything in the present. So when you go back and read that, and it's specifically about Jairus' daughter, uh, in verse 22 it says, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue. Because in English, we need to put it into the past because it's something that happened earlier than just this moment. But in the Greek, he's using the words, so a better translation would be, then, or one of the rulers of the synagogue came, or comes, that's the right word, one of the rulers of the synagogue comes, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he falls at his feet. He puts it right into the present tense. So I want you to think about this. Has there ever been a moment, um, a very significant memory in your life where you can just stop and you can actually see it, like you can remember that moment and like look around the room and see everything that was happening in that moment as if it were happening right then and there. Do you have any of those moments? If you're a Harry Potter nerd, which, yeah, Maddie, I'm talking to you, right? Because we're on the same page. We're talking like the Pensieve, okay? You're right in that memory, and you can see everything unfolding right there as it's happening. Because it's so significant, so powerful, and so immediate, it creates a sense of, like, urgency. This is unfolding right before my eyes. It's not just something that happened yesterday. It's something that is imparting something right now in this moment, and it creates an urgency to it. So you heard immediately this, and then immediately that. Then came this. He's coming right now, and then this is being done. And it gives you the sense of, wow, this is right now in your presence occurring. This only happens like three times in Mark. And it puts it into a stark contrast that draws you into what's happening and unfolding right before your eyes. Like watching a play or a movie. So... He has it in this contrast, and there's these two significant healings that happen. One of the lady with the issue of blood, the other with Jairus' daughter being raised. Now, when you study the scriptures, um, and when you're reading for your own personal spiritual wellness and just time with the Lord, I want you to ask three simple questions. What does this say about God? Okay? That's question number one. What does this say about God? What does this say about Jesus? Because Jesus is the, the fruition of the will of God is being told through the scriptures of who God's character is, what his plan is. That's all made known through Jesus' work. So how does that relate to this idea of who God is? And then third, what does this say about me? Anytime you're studying the scriptures and reading through these, those are three simple questions to ask. What does this say about God? What does this say about Jesus? And what does this say about who I am in relationship to Jesus, to God? So we're going to unpack that just a little bit as I'm going to teach you how to do that this morning as well. So first of all, we have this story. Jesus is in a boat. He had mentioned earlier, hey, I need to have a boat and I need to be getting away from people because otherwise these crowds are going to come and try to trample me, which is exactly what they're trying to do as he's trying to head to Jairus' house. When they're on him, they're bumping against him, they're pushing against him, they're trying to see what's going on. They're, they're all up in his business. Have any of you ever been to Disney World pre-COVID? I'm guessing it's like that. People everywhere, all over the place, all up in your business. So, ironically, he has this boat, and he doesn't use it. He's going instead to Jairus' house. But as he's getting off the boat, and he's there, and the great crowd is around him, we see this ruler of the synagogue come and fall at his feet. Now, this is an important historical context, because there's three ways that you greet somebody who you are allowed to greet. Okay, so we're stepping past like gender roles. We're stepping past beggars to leaders to all of that. If you're actually able to greet them, uh, there's three ways to do that. If you are on equal terms, you can greet them with a kiss right on the lips. If you believe that one of you has a higher authority or respect within the community, that person would be kissed on the cheek. Sound familiar? Maybe when Judas comes and kisses Jesus on the cheek before he's arrested. 
That's a greeting. And if the difference between the two of you is that very, very significant, so this person is, is very um, respected and has a high position of authority, and you are but a beggar, you would come and literally prostrate yourself before them. And you would just lay down on your knees, and you would just bow and beg. And that would show a huge act of submission. Not only to you, not only to the person you're greeting, but also to everybody who's around. This is big, because what we've seen earlier in Mark is that the rulers of the synagogue, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of them, they're not big fans of Jesus as a group. But we also see that Jairus, and maybe then some others, do actually think Jesus is something significant, and maybe even our only hope in his circumstance. Now, what he says to him is earnestly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be made well. Sozo is the word, but made well can also be saved. That's important. So you could hear it in saying, lay your hands on her that she may be saved and live. You get where the overtone of that is going? I hope you do. Now, what's going on here is this laying of hands. He sees Jesus not as a physician, but instead as a healer, as a holy man of God. Because physicians do not lay their hands on people in this time. We think of physicians as offering, offering remedies, maybe like an apothecary, maybe giving them some different things to try. But instead, a physician, like we're going to see with this one with the issue of blood, a physician comes to you and looks at the social implications of your disease. When they think of disease, like the things that are going wrong inside of you, we think of that as like cause and effect. You caught a virus, you didn't wash your hands, you got bacteria because you didn't clean the cutout, therefore now you have an infection. They look at it as you have a problem and it's socially relatable because they don't think so much individually in first century Palestine. They think as a group where we're very individualistic. So your physician would come and say, hey, what's going on in your life? Oh, you're sick because you do X, Y, and Z. Or because you're not doing enough of ABC. So are you, are you offering enough sacrifices? Are you living a life that is pleasing to God? Are you honoring the Sabbath correctly? Tell me everything you did on the Sabbath, and I'll let you know what the problem is and why you are the way you are because of it. You see that all through Job, right? You see it all over the place. This kind of cause and effect of your social actions have the implication for why you have a sickness or an illness. Those people are very not helpful, as we see from the woman with the issue of blood. But when Jairus comes to Jesus, he says, I'm not interested in thoughts and opinions on what's happening. This girl is almost going to die, and she has my heart. I need you to come put your hands on her as a holy man and save her life. And he's willing to humiliate himself because he believes that Jesus can do it. There's the first part. Then we jump into this mini story in the midst of the Jairus story, the Jairus and his daughter. And we see this woman who has an issue of blood. The crowds thronged around him, and we see this woman who is apparently wealthy and apparently a widow because she's allowed to spend the money how she wants. Um, not that it stops you. <laughs> Just kidding. It's a joke. I'm glad you're home. Don't kill me. <laughs> I've missed her. Brittany's been gone for four days in Arkansas, so I haven't gotten to pick on her for like three days because she did call me. So anyway, this woman's probably a widow, and she's had an issue of blood, okay? So we're talking like a lady parts issue of blood, and it's not just like a once a month issue. It's like a, it just doesn't stop, and it's been for 12 years. She's got a real problem. Everybody kind of knows, whether it's a thousand years ago or today, if you keep losing the red stuff out of your body, life's not going to go well. We want to keep that stuff inside because that's how we stay alive. That's how we stay healthy and can live life um, in the ways that we want to. So we have this woman. She's tried all of those different physicians. It's only gotten worse, even though they've given her all these recommendations and all these ideas. And then she hears the reports about Jesus. Now, you got to know, um, Old Testament-wise, we're going to look at Leviticus 15, 25 to 30. This is what it says about God. God says this to Moses as the people are coming out of Egypt. This is your conduct for how you're going to live as my people. He says, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, 
Or if she has uh, a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanness because you know that cleanliness and purity is a, is a big deal for God's people. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, she shall be to her the bed of her impurity. Everything on which she sits shall be unclean as in the uncleanness of her menstrual impurity. I know, you guys are really excited that I'm telling you about all this. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean and she shall wash and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, she shall count for herself seven days. And after, she, after that, then she shall be clean. So you're getting, and we can just be done with this now. It just keeps going on, and I'm getting tired of reading it. So if she touches anything, it's unclean. If she sits on anything, it's unclean. Even if it stops, she's got to wait seven days, then do the washing, then offer the turtle doves, and then finally she can come back into the community and be with them. Because to be unclean, what we see also in Numbers 5, 1 through 2, means that you are not part of the community any longer. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous, or has a discharge, and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. Three things. You are no longer part of the community. You have to be separate. So when this woman who has the discharge hears through gossip train, through something, because she's not really part of the group, that there's this Jesus, that he's a holy man, and that he might be just her only hope. She comes into the crowd, which is not okay. And she reaches out and touches Jesus' garment, which is really not okay. It is not appropriate in first century Palestine for a woman to touch a man in public, let alone a stranger or a holy man, let alone a woman who is unclean because of a discharge, and now she has touched his clothes. According to Leviticus, what has now happened to Jesus? He's unclean. He now has to go and do the bathing, and he now has to go through all the rituals and be separate and then do all that stuff. I mean, like, there's a lot there according to the social implications of what she is willing to do in order to get her healing. But she says, even if I touch just his garments, I will be made well. And Mark says, immediately. As soon as she has reached out and put her hands on the fabric, immediately in that instance, she knows deep in her bones that her ailment is gone, that she has been sozo, saved. What's really awesome in this next part of the story, which nobody likes to talk about, is Jesus and the depiction of this weird Jesus. And he is weird in Mark. Jesus feels that. Now in Matthew, it says, I perceive that this has happened. And he looks right at the woman and says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. But in Mark, he's like, who touched me? We're like, Jesus, you're God. You know who touched you. You made them in their mother's womb before the beginning of creation. You intended for this to happen. Don't play with me, Jesus, you silly devil. According to the Pharisees, that's literally what they would call him, you silly devil. His disciples are like, Jesus, everybody is touching you. Everybody's touching all of us. This is a miserable mess. But he asks, and she, in pertinence, yet fear and trembling, in full honesty, says, it was me. And I'm gross. And I'm unlovable. And I am not able to be around anybody. And I am sick. And because I touched you, now you're going to have to go and deal with my issues because I've made them your issues. And I'm this is who I am. And she expects to be ostracized, ridiculed, condemned by this holy man. How dare you step past the, the designations and the laws of God? Because that's what the Pharisees would do. That's what the rulers of the synagogue would do. Because that's what God said it meant to be in relationship to him. But here's your next question. Jesus is not concerned about physical cleanliness. Do you remember what it said in Numbers chapter 5, 1 through 21? It says, you keep out of your camp everyone who is leprous or discharged or has been with the dead. And what did we see in Mark 1? 41 to 42. 
Jesus sees a leper who says, I'm unclean, don't come near me. And Jesus reaches out his hand and touches the unclean man. And Sozo saves him. This woman touches his garment and doesn't make Jesus unclean. Jesus' holiness makes her righteous, makes her sozo saved. When Jesus says at the beginning of Mark, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he is ushering in God's will for the end, for all creation. What he is showing her in that moment is you have been brought in because how does he address the woman? Look, how does he address the woman? As soon as he says, who touched me? He asks again, who touched me? She says, I did it, it was me. This is who I am, I'm gross, I'm disgusting, I'm a sinner, I'm unclean, I'm not worthy to be in relationship with you, let alone touch you, I'm sorry for what it's cost you. He says to her, daughter. He doesn't say, get away from me, woman. He doesn't say, be gone, you unclean, revolting, gross person. He doesn't just look over her and say, I'm not even going to talk to you. You're not worth my time. He calls her daughter. Two weeks ago, he says, who are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters? Are not these, are not these who are with me? who hold faithfulness to me, who are loyal to me, who are committed, who trust in me. These are mine. And what he does for this woman, so do I have made you well. I have saved you. Now you are not outside of my people. You are part of my people. And not just part of my people, you are my family. And as Jairus loves his daughter and will humiliate himself to save her life, so you are my daughter. And you know where this story goes because he's going to humiliate himself to love and save her. You are connected. You are welcomed. No matter how the culture and how society sees your sin and says you are untouchable, you're gross, you give me the heebie-jeebies, you are mine because you have put your trust and your loyalty and your hope in me. Now, I'm weepy and I have allergies. This is like the worst moment. I can't even see. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be saved of your disease. Not just healed from the issuance of blood, but you've been brought into the life eternal, the kingdom of heaven in my name. Sozo, saved. Then, while he's speaking, here comes the ruler of the house, or one of the rulers of the house people, and they said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Overhearing, Jesus says, don't fear, only believe. Only put your trust in me. Put your fidelity in me. Don't, don't wonder. Don't expect other things. Just hold on. Because she's not dead, she's asleep. Now, if you're wondering... This is an interesting point. Why do they use Talitha Kumi, which is Aramaic? It's not even the, the Hebrew. Why do they put the Telemitha Kumi in there? Because they believed that those exact words that Jesus used had power. God's word has power. So they didn't just translate it into the Greek and just say, he just said to them, arise, uh, get up, that whole thing. Little girl, I say to you, arise. But they put the exact words in there because they know that this Jesus, when he speaks, speaks with authority. And the very words that he utters out of his mouth come with power. And so they are worthy to be added specifically in the text. We don't stand on our own authority. We stand on his authority and his word which has manifested the power of God presently here with us as this is unfolding. He goes in, and by his very word, he says to the little girl, arise. And what we see in the beginning of Mark is that Jesus goes after those who should be separate from the community. The leper, those with a discharge, and those who've touched and been with the dead. And not just those who've been around the dead, the very dead themselves. And he sozos them. He saves them. He brings them out, and he makes them his own. 
It doesn't say that Jairus had the same faith, but we see because of the structure that the, the faith that brought Jairus to his knees to prostrate himself before Jesus is the same faith as this woman with the issuance of blood. Your faith, your fidelity, your loyalty, your, your holding tight to me has done this work. So go in my peace. Go in my peace, for you are saved. And then it says, he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. That's a community statement. He called the woman with the issuance of blood a daughter. He says to the girl who's been dead, go eat with your family. Come together into that space and commune, be together. He welcomes her back into community. What does it say about God and certainly what this says about Jesus? Jesus is a new age and a new era where sin and death are not going to separate us from God, but we are going to be in relationship through the power of Jesus. Now here's a third question. What does this say about me? How do you take away from this? So there's a trope in musicals and in storytelling called minor character, major song. And you see this around. Okay, uh, the one that's probably most recent, um, if you've seen it, have you seen Hamilton? The musical Hamilton, right? So King George um, is really not a significant part of the story. Like, he doesn't actually do anything in the actual story. Like, if you pulled that character out of the story, you've lost nothing in the musical. And yet, this guy gets on stage and sings the most catchy song of the entire musical, if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's hilarious. And he gets on and he does it three times. It's the same tune. It's the same song, just with a couple extra lyrics. And everybody just loves King George. He's a minor part, and yet he plays a major contribution just by this little song to the effect of the story. In the Gospel of Mark... You would think that the disciples, that Peter, James, and John, who are with him when he sees the girl be raised, who's with him at the transfiguration, who are there praying with him and are at the, the cross with him, would have significant big moments, big songs of faithfulness and fidelity and trust and obedience. Those moments like where Peter's like, you are the son of the living God, and that's going to be my entire tune for this story. Not, I'm going to reject you three times. It's going to be awful. I'm going to cry. I'm going to leave all those extra things. But in the Gospel of Mark, what he teaches us is, guess what? The major players don't get Jesus. They struggle because he looks really human, because he does weird things, and it doesn't make sense. And yet these minor people, this woman who's not even named, Jairus, who we don't have any other connection to at all in the story, these people, in just this beautiful moment of faithfulness, show us what it means to be loved by God through Jesus. They're not disciples, but they get it. They get it. This is the guy on whom we put our hope because he's the one who can show up and do something. Guess what? You don't have to be a major character. You don't have to live a life of big, important influence and, and connection and be this pivotal moment in history where everybody's looking to you. You don't have to be powerful and important and impactful. That's not how God works. But to live a life that knows Jesus and knows what he means in the little things in life is worthy of joy, celebration, and certainly the glory of God. Because we're talking about these little stories 2,000 years later. If I might just hold to this crazy man of Nazareth who can heal all of our troubles who can save even the most untouchable and that includes me Jesus is going to take these people to the cross as he humbles himself to die for their sins and in his humility lay down his life in order that he might pick it up and that we might have sozo in his name that no matter what life might look like, he would receive all honor and praise from this day until life everlasting. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. 
I pray that as you continue to study these scriptures, that God would open up your heart and your mind to the truth of what this means for who he is, who Christ is, and how this is impacting your life, and that we can continue to journey in this, this blessed life of faithfulness together. According to the work that God has done, we also collect uh, and receive the tithes and offerings, the gifts that God has given us through the many gifts that he gives each one of us and the resources that we have, whether it's our time, our talents, our gifts, whatever that looks like. And we bring those to the Lord and ask that he bless them and use them, even in the small ways. Um, as we leave, and we're going to continue this for the foreseeable future, um, we receive those gifts in baskets on your way out of the building. If you're online, we do that through three ways you can do it from distance which is uh, you can mail it, you can do it on the website, you can do it through your phone. There's lots of different ways to participate and get connected uh, into this faith community. But we also respond to God's faithfulness um, in a joyful thanksgiving of our songs and of our praise because of who he is and how he's worked in our lives. And so we'll join together in offering that song of praise with our next song. And so I invite you to stay seated. Stand. That's what pastors do, and then you all stand up. fails me and all my days I've been held by your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God sing all my life Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire And in darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Let's sing that again all my life all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Today is the first song that we're singing this at St. Luke's. And during the sermon, I was just thinking about this bridge. Your goodness is running after me. And I don't know about you. <laughs> but I look back, and there are so many times that his goodness ran after me. all of our stories are so different how we came to know the Lord how we came to this place but if there's one thing I know that we have in common is that for every single one of us he came running and his goodness chased us down and so we want to teach you this bridge and we want to sing it together as a family of faith your goodness is running now it's running left 
to me. Sing that one more time. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Let's sing that again together. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. This is running after, it's running after me. If my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Let's sing it out one more time. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness. It's running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Let's sing that one more time. All my life. so, so good with every breath that I am faithful. Lord, you're so good. I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. Confession runs right out of the song, and those authentic moments happen. Lord, I'm reminded of Mark chapter 9, where a little boy, uh, a dad with a little boy who's demon-possessed comes to Jesus, and he begs him to forgive, to, to heal, to sozo my son. Jesus says, only have faith, only believe, and he says, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Lord, I'm loyal. I believe it. I hope it. I, I know that you're the only one who can help, but help me in my doubt. Help me in those moments where my life doesn't line up with that truth, where this body of flesh and damnation needs to be healed and saved like Mark or like, uh, like Paul in Romans 7. Who will save me from this body of death? Let's take just a minute to quiet our hearts and our minds and to ask Jesus, I believe and help me in my unbelief, in my faithlessness. It says that God looked and he was appalled that there was no one righteous. There was no one worthy or capable of intervening in the dastardly situation of all creation and their sin and death. And so his own arm worked salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. That promise is realized as Jesus shows up on this earth and says, You're faithless. I can give you a faith. You're imperfect. I can make you perfect in my perfection. In my death and in my resurrection, you are forgiven. You are brought in and you will have life in my name. And in his faithfulness, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. 
Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the little stories, the minor characters that you have moved in big ways to see who you are and your faithfulness, even to the sparrows, the lilies of the field, to those who seem unnoticeable, even us. And Lord, we ask that you would bring your will and your countenance upon them, that you'd bring healing, that you would rejoice with them in the triumphs and the joys of the day, that you would sustain us through relationships and through the celebration of continued time and life together. Lord, we pray always that your will would be done. In all these things, we thank you for the joy of sending your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to be our sin and to be our Savior. And according to his mercies, we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Sons, daughters, it is your faith that has saved you. The faith that our Lord Jesus Christ sends you in by the power of the Holy Spirit to live together in community, to live in his hope to life everlasting. So go in his peace and in his joy in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Feel free to put your hands together, church. Nothing can separate, even if I run away, cause your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have your mercies for me every day, your love
in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.